Hey podcast listeners, welcome to episode 7 of Misfits. This is where I speak to the rebels, the troublemakers and the cool folks in Singapore. Try to see things as how they see it and learn from them. Some of these individuals include Dr. Laura Chen, who is the consultant for the Kingdom of Bhutan. Betty Lee, who at the age of 60 went backpacking around the world for 400 days. And today on the show, we have a very humble and sweaty guest, also a friend of mine, Rafi Chua. So he's the founder and woodworker behind Custom Furniture Studio Plain and Bevel. In a fast-paced and consumerist society, he left his job at banking and dived into this dying industry. So Rafi's furniture creation can be found in restaurants, cafes such as Odette, Merrily Ice Cream, Choice Cuts, and maybe your friend's apartment who have a great taste for handmade furniture. So he has also most recently been featured on the Michelin Guide Singapore. In this podcast, we speak about machineries, woodworking techniques, his views on hand tools, the differences that separate a hobbyist and a professional, and the different school of thoughts in woodworking. So without further ado, before we really start, I want to tell a quick story about how we met. Um, so it might be 2014, right? <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, when uh, Play and Bevel first started out. Uh, I just came back from my gap year from South America. And then uh, and I was starting my wedding planning business. But at the same time, I had this like, great idea <laughs> to, to build a, a library in front of my house, this uh, wooden box. And so then I met Fanny from Finn. And he introduced me to you, which then I sort of just texted you out of the blue. Mm. Do you think it was... <laughs> was I a weird guy? It's like yeah, that was kind of it was kind of strange. Huh? Your your request was really quite strange huh? when you told me that you wanted to build a library. Huh? See, in my head, I was thinking like rows and rows of books. So, but I entertained the idea lah, and then you know I finally found out that it was uh what's that free library? Huh? Uh-huh. Yeah, the like the one we made lah. So I came by with that to you with like a half built library with a few cut out and you had no idea how tough it was building a library because back then it was really there was no table and we're just like on the floor clamping it to some wooden yeah, planks. I know. you showed me the photos <laughs> yeah. uh. and we're, dr- we're drilling the the wood with a drill and then screwing the screw in which we are when we're using plywood the wood split and when i came to you you'd be like well, check out this air compressor machine. I was like, what is this amazing thing? Nail gun. I, I, well, I introduced you to the world, nail gun. Yes. And I was just like, okay, I'm never going back to this <laughs> drilling <laughs> nailing again. And then, but, but you know, there was one time we were actually making a door. And oh. you remember the time? <laughs> yeah. And I was just like, okay, Rafi, you know, lah, I think we'll just, uh, I'll just pay someone to, to, to do it. It's really tough. You were so flustered, man. Like you, you couldn't you couldn't see the end of the the project. But because we don't have a concrete solution to solve the problem, it's more like try and error. I was because for me, uh, making things right, it's just it's a process. Uh. So you take it through the whole way, and then you get the result uh, But there are steps uh, that you have to do. So I think at that point, you 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 couldn't see that uh. You couldn't see that. You know, if you just do this right, and then you will get a door. You know, but we weren't building any door too. Oh, because there was a plastic, uh, there was acrylic sheet. Oh, the frame, the frame, the frame yeah, was yeah, the frame. <laughs> yeah, the frame was the frame was a bit tricky, lah. Yeah, so that that was that was there. Well, a big thank you to 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 you. Right, you you're welcome. Made that happen. I went to your uh, your house for the like the opening. Right, that was quite encouraging. Uh, to see people. Um, Quite positive about what you wanted to wanted wanted to achieve. Uh. So well, it was quite I was nice, also uh. being quite an asshole to you too, and then you're like, actually, <laughs> this thing is not very stable if we have like a one pillar thing, and you're like, no, no, no. I, I was like, hey, I wanted one pillar, and you're like, no, let me two pillar will be more balanced, and we managed to figure out that rig right, which I'm still very proud of today, which no one will ever know how like they never look below the library to see how it's being fixed to that one pole. Yeah la. <laughs> But for those all of you guys who are out there, please check out the bottom. That was the most <laughs> out thing that I think we and, and the door and the door too. There was a magnet thing we, we, we did together. <laughs> it was fantastic. It's like your baby, yeah. Yeah. It's but maybe let's just start off with um the definition of carpenter and woodworker. Because that's what we're gonna be used a lot today. And you really strongly emphasize the difference of that, right? You have to give it context. Huh? 
in in Singapore, carpentry is mainly referred to um, working with plywood and laminates. So, like your 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 kitchen cabinets, they they are made of plywood and laminates. So, in in the olden days, they used to do it everything out of solid wood. So natural timber, you know, uh, that is uh, that still can move, wood movement. But now, because of um, you know, Singapore is developed at such a you know fast pace uh, that people need homes uh, and they need it quick. So plywood was um, plywood is a, a solution to you know um, fulfilling these demands at a very short time, uh, within a very short time, because it takes a lot longer to process solid wood into um, big planks to make cabinets uh, and it's a lot more expensive also. So I guess carpentry in Singapore um, is about working with plywood and laminates and woodworking is more of working with uh, natural timber. So like uh, wood processed out of logs and then you make into furniture. So I guess woodworking is it's more um, there's a lot more room for uh, artistic expression because uh. it's furniture, you know. You, you've seen really beautiful furniture, right? But how nice of a, like, a kitchen, kitchen um, cabinet have you seen, yes, you know? Yes. Yeah, they're, back, they're, in the, back in the days, those are very, very pretty. Yeah, now, because if they make out of solid wood, cabinets, kitchen cabinets can be really nice. Uh. And usually back then, it was thick, right? Around here, the region. Yeah, yeah. Oh, because, a few because of our proximity to like, Burma, you know, and Thailand, where they have a lot of thick um, plantations. But now, obviously, with the you know people using have having used a lot Over of thick, yeah, yeah, overuse, yeah. So a lot of trees are all cut. Those big old thick trees, no, no longer. Already. And I guess when I first met you in that in that space at where's that Tai Seng. Area. Oh, no, that was in Kalang Pudding. Kalang Pudding, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I remember. I know, and, you, and you were actually sharing a space with another prop com a rental company and uh, yeah. uh, setting up super cool like photo booth <laughs> yeah. that you built for weddings. And so maybe just a quick story of how, what's the sequence of events that lead you from in university in Mel Melbourne, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, to then when I met you. Uni, I did... Um, a bachelor in commerce. Ah, it's completely unrelated, lah. I mean, but but you know that was something I I was good at, so it just did it, lah. And and after uni, I realized that, you know, just because you're good at something doesn't mean you have to do it for the rest of your life, lah. So I started um, I started looking outwards, lah. Started um searching for things that, you know, I could possibly do for the rest of my life, lah. Because that was that's the end goal uh, for me. Um, so after after uni, I I worked in banking for a while. And for a while, it's only like six months, and I couldn't take it really. So I um I I got I got some money and I bought four hundred shares from um China. So that one was put because um my sister was getting married, so she was like. And she's always been the she's the youngest in the family lah. Yeah. So she's always been very um taken care of. Yeah. So she came up to me and she said, um, hey, why don't you um why don't you uh invest in these chairs? I knew her agenda, la, but you know, I'm her brother, right? So you can use it um to you can rent it out, you know, start a business. So she was the first person who gave you the business proposition. Yeah, yeah, and she was my first customer also. <laughs> and that, that's how it all started. Uh. Just plonked down a lot of cash. You know, um, risk, uh, risk uh, not getting the chairs because it's, well, it was my first time buying, uh, investing in China. So there was that two weeks before it arrived, right? Like, I didn't hear from the supplier, you know. It was so scary. I, I, Did I you go on Alipay calling. or was it Taobao kind of um, situation? Ali, Alibaba Ex Express. Alibaba Express. Yeah. Chinese. 
everything right up to the point where I transferred the money right, was good, you know, like he was on time with, with his replies and everything. Okay. But I guess maybe he was busy uh, because the chairs did arrive in the end. Uh. So he came in the container and then there was, we had to unpack everything. And that's when I got my first space uh, in Kalang also. But it was just like part of a unit where I stored the chairs. And that's when I started marketing them out. And your brother helped you to find, find that place? Yeah, yeah my brother is a property agent. That's correct. So it was all very convenient. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I, didn't, I, I had him help me look for a space. And that was, that was, that was pretty much where it all began. Uh, you know, being on my own. Um, making your own money, that kind of thing. Did you quit already, your job? Yeah, by that time, yeah, I did. So I, I, I couldn't take it. Like, it was just long hours, you know, and with nothing nothing to be proud of. Well, for me, like, maybe some people are really proud of like having a stable job, you know. Um, but not me. Like, I, couldn't, I couldn't hack it. Like. So then after, while I was applying the chairs, people started asking me for props for their weddings so I, I i thought maybe i i i had a little bit of know-how with woodworking so i did like, i made some props and then uh, i started an instagram account for the stuff that i made uh. i remember your first prop was the chair table they can put together was oh yeah, that the, was that, yeah. The first? that was that was a secondary school friend of mine she, she just moved in she just got married and then they needed a nesting table so nesting table is basically three tables that, that come into one. So you can take them out and it becomes three tables, but you can also put them back together. And that was, that was very um, reassuring uh, because they really like you know, what I made. And uh, things started to roll from there. Uh. It just picked up momentum. Like I didn't really do any marketing. It's just Instagram. So I guess you know, being right in the middle of... Um, the, 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 the time where Instagram started to pick up, you know, and then people started to see the stuff that I made online, and then it just started, it just kept rolling uh, until we are here. So, this is the third space then. The, 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 the place I met you was the second place? Oh, yeah, yeah. That was Kalang Pudding. Yeah, how did, how did mom and dad, you know, feel about this? Because after all, they did invest a lot of money to. To put you through in Melbourne, right? Oh, uni, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think at first they were a bit like um, confused. Like, confused, you know? okay. They were like, what is this guy doing? You know, but, but my parents are business owners too. So, you know, I guess they, they, they got over it really quickly. Lah. And then they just started to support. And I think that one was really crucial. Lah. Their support. Lah. Because... Um, I think without their support, uh, I wouldn't have had the... It would have been a lot harder. Uh, a lot more tiring, you know. Like my mom, my mom likes to make dinner. So, you know, that was for me... Even though it was like something really simple as dinner, right? You know, after one whole day of slogging out at the shop, uh, and then you go home for dinner, it's like... It's shock, uh. <laughs> yeah, It's kind of like it, recuperating, uh. For me, that one, you know, a simple home-cooked meal is the best. Uh. How do your friends feel about it? Friends, uh, yeah. I thought I was crazy. Uh. <laughs> like this guy, he went to study overseas and then got a job in a bank and then throws it all away to buy some chairs in China, from China. You know, that was the, the first the chairs. Uh, and then after that, it was like making furniture. I guess because the a lot of my friends, right, they... They don't know anything about um, like blue collar work, and it's not their fault. Really, it's not their fault. It's like how Singapore is, uh, You know, if you ask any parent, like, what would you want your children to be when you grow up? When they grow up, you know, I want them to, you know, go to uni, uh, graduate, do well in school, and then get a nice, comfortable job. Presumably, where like in an office, right? right? And no, I don't think any brand like really says very proudly, uh, like, I want my son to be a mechanic. You know, that kind of thing. Blue collar work, uh, like, you know. So I guess it's something they didn't understand. For me, so, um, I guess I didn't really understand blue collar work. Uh, but I knew 
white collar work wasn't for me. I couldn't, I don't think I could do it. So for me, it was like something new, lah, but I was really willing to just try anything I did. But you came out of, out of like, would you say, desperation of like just immensely hating the office yeah. job? Yeah, it, it was that. Lah. I, because, you know, I, I couldn't, I really couldn't take it. Lah. It's very long hours. And then when you finish, lah, you get so tired and then you have no time to do anything else. So it, it's, like, it's like me... It's like me at that point of time when you did the frame. Like, you couldn't see the end. You know? <laughs> That's a great analogy. I couldn't see the end of it all. Like, I, I can't imagine myself doing that for like 20 years. But you did have Saturday and Sunday off though, right? Yeah lah, but you know. Okay. It, it, it's akin to like saying... But you're dying I'm, five days and then you, you, you yeah. try to recuperate for two days. If I, was, if I was to do that for the rest of my life, right, it's just like me selling my time, you know. And if you're going to sell your time, because you can't get it back anyway, why not you sell your time doing something you like? You know? At least you can, um, you, get the, you get the money and you get to say, hey, I did something I really like with my life. I remember back then too, you, you started, I mean, that's the wedding chair rental mm -hmm. business and then slowly the furniture soft came later. And then you started like Yellowstone and Play and Bevel Soft at this. Is it at the same time or one before the other? It was at the same time for uh, a period. Uh. Why, so why was, do you want to separate it? But because Yellowstone was more of um, rental services. Uh. I wanted, I knew what I wanted with Plain and Bevel. I wanted to set up a brand. Something that people can associate with um, what I what I want them to know about the brand. Lah. Because in Singapore, um, it's very hard to find local makers that, that, um, that do that whole sort of package with branding. And there are actually, there are um, custom makers in Singapore, but they're, mo they're mainly in their like 50s. They're like old school guys. Ah. And for them, it was really... <clears throat> It was really um, to make a living, uh, because that was what they knew, what they knew how to do. Those guys from China, you know, those carpenters from yeah. China. So what I wanted to do was not really just to make a living. I wanted I want to curate a brand. There was there's something that Singapore is lacking, uh. and which is why you separate both of them yeah. because they are clearly distinctly yeah. really two different kind of business. It's very important that people know that Plain and Bevel is. A furniture brand <coughs> locally made <coughs> and um, the emphasis on quality and design uh, I think you know if, if it goes in that direction then a lot of people will benefit uh. and do you still do Yellowstone stuff now a lot less uh. I've still got inquiries I, I, I cannot fulfill them just because you know I only have 24 hours in a day. Well, the thought is Minus to, 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 to sell the chairs away, right? <laughs> yeah, but it's still there. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a thorn in my side, uh, but <laughs> what will you eventually mean? it will go. Will you use some, the space for something no, else? No, I was thinking like, you know, just like uh, off offering them to any interior job that I have, right? Just to like decorate the place with the chairs. Like, you know, coastal settlement along Changi? Yeah. You know how they have chairs on Outside, top? Outside, right? No, on top, I think. They hang chairs from the ceiling. Wait, is this the one that they cut into half and then they, they ah, stick yeah, it up? Yeah. So, I mean, they could be used for that. Like, there's a lot of things uh, that they could be used for. <laughs> but right now, they're just sitting there. <laughs> well, it's okay with me like, because I have a lot of things going on right now. You know, I spent, um, what, two years trying to stabilise plain and bevel. Yeah, I think, well, the next question is exactly that, right? I think the transition is very simple because it's just sort of like by, by business. Until you can't do the chairs, then you just sort of max yourself out and transit more and more, and more into woodworking. So actually in the start, the, the money-making uh, thing was the chair and that yeah. was, was very needed to sustain Plain and Bevel too. And now that Plain and Bevel has sort of taken off, then you sort of do less and less of the Yellowstone yeah. stuff. And you have many people come and go. Um, yeah, interns, um, partner, partner only one. And that one was, one is a bit more of a longer story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's different set of challenges. 
you know, because I work very closely with him. I see him every day. And a lot of the projects, um, we need to work very closely. We need to be almost like thinking the same thing. And it's a different set of challenges, meaning like I need to be very mindful that I'm not doing this alone anymore. Because previously, it was only me. And yeah. in terms of construct, design, or running the shop, it was just me. And you have people that you pay like per day yeah, to and, like, come help you send. It's not that their stuff. opinions didn't matter, but <laughs> <laughs> my opinion was the primary one. Correct. And that, that, was, how I, that was how I run the place. Uh. So now we've joined around and he's putting in a lot of... Um, a lot of he's pulling a lot of weight. Uh, like he, he helps with you know branding and you know the the construction of stuff so i have to be mindful to not um be too like too big you know like to too um overpowering like commanding okay. you know saying how do like, you do how do you do <laughs> no so you have to you have to listen number one you have to listen and not only like to the things that they say you know the the his actions you know um it's important uh, because um, the, when, when people feel like you know, their voice is not heard, uh, then they'll stop talking. Uh. And that's not what I want. Uh. I, he's very creative. He was, um, he was a chef before meeting me. So if you think about it, right, the kitchen is much like a workshop. You know, you take raw ingredients. It goes through a process of um, creativity. And then it goes to your dinner table. You know, it's a lot like what we do here. So I guess that's why he has found um, a, a place of belonging here. Yeah, it's a lot like what he did in the kitchen, but it's more, it's more like what he, what he wants to do. So sometimes I catch myself um, being a bit too egoistic, right? you know, like, like this design is the one we should do, you know, you know we should use this material. But then that's when, you know, I remember that, you know, I'm not in this alone. And I should consider his opinion, his idea. And sometimes if you take a step back and then you look at the bigger picture, right, it, it, it sort of makes sense huh, to, you know, um, uh, allow other people to give input. Because, you know, after all, two heads are better than one. No, for sure. Is Lin still around? No, I think Lin has moved on to do her own thing. She's um she's doing um indigo natural indigo dyeing. Oh, cool! It's really cool. Uh. I I love her. I love the the color of the dye and the whole process. Like Very she was cool. she she used to do it here for a while. She used to use the the toilet area and then you know the hanging where we hang the stuff. But um. I think she she's now she's doing it more at home, because uh, maybe because the shop is dusty, you know, it affects the yeah. quality of the. So yeah, but occasionally she comes uh, when she needs to cut material. John Lin, man, let's move on to the topic. It's quite, it sounds quite sad, uh. Uh, <laughs> A lot of people leaving. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> But that's evolution. Yeah, but that's part and parcel of being a, a, yeah. a business. But you know, like you, we were discussing back then about, you know, like your interns coming in. Uh, who was that? Um, the furniture designer mm. guy. And I guess maybe the question would be, what do you want to see more, man, in young furniture designer? Or... Um, resilience, huh? Pretty much, like, having the um, perseverance uh, to go through with something. Is you know, that actual, I mean, it's just staying for longer hours? <laughs> Coming in on Saturday? Not really. Uh, I, I have had interns who, who wouldn't try welding, for example. Like, I didn't know how to weld when I first started. It was just woodworking. Um, I've had interns who wouldn't try. Is it because you didn't talk to them? Why did they not want to try? No, I did. I did. Okay. I invited them, you know, to try. 
It was, it was quite shot. dangerous, what? I mean, I... Yeah, but you know, if you know what you're doing, <laughs> you, won't, you, won't, you won't injure yourself no, really badly. No, because when, we, when I meet like Osu Carpenter, and I look at their machine, I'm like afraid of my life because they don't have, don't, they don't have safety. In their, yeah, their plate. But you see, that, that's where, you know, that's where I'm different. Lah. Safety is quite important for me in the shop. Because if you lose your hand, <laughs> you cannot, you know, what are you going to make? Nothing. You, yes. cannot, you, cannot, you cannot continue. So you got to use common sense. Lah, is that there's always a safer method. That's, that's something very important uh, that I, I, I live by. Uh. There's always a safer method. Uh. Sometimes, so more resilience uh, in, hmm? in the interns. Uh, you want to see younger... Yeah, be more open. Uh. To try new things. Why do you think they're not? I don't know. <laughs> I'm trying to figure that out myself. <laughs> it's a mystery of life, right? <laughs> um, what's the most proud project uh, that you have did under Play and Bevel? Proud, uh. Feature Wars. Uh. I like Feature Wars. This is the one that we did together? Yeah. You're not saying this just because I'm here, right? No, no, no. <laughs> Why would I? No, <laughs> la. It, it's nice. Uh. It's, it, it, it lets me do something that... Because the client, right, he was very laid back. Uh. He was like, you know, just do something for me. Uh. Yeah. Also, by the way, um, it's basically a, a wood wall with different wood that we collected. Old, old wood. They have different sort of like uh, colors, and some have paint on it. And we, we cut them out and chop them, and sort of like stick them into the wall. Some of them we even create a shelf for them to put yeah. stuff, right? It's almost like a very nice medley of art, you know, and woodworking. So I guess that's where that's that's why I like it so much, because you get to play with colors, and but at the same time, it's woodworking, la. It's a job, you know. <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's, Actually, since we're on that point, maybe I think everyone should try to know this because I, I know it because I did that librarian. It was a painstaking process. But maybe <laughs> just sort of tell me your design or production process from the start of like a client writing you an email or writing a message to okay. the finished product. So they get in touch either by email or they just give me a call. And then what I do is I invite them to come and have a conversation with me, just like what we're having now. Um, so we, we, we talk about um, what they want to make, whether they have a design in mind. If they don't, then I'll offer them, um, I'll offer to design their piece. Uh, and then um, it's, it's really just a conversation. Uh, but it, it'll, it'll be like a span of like three months, you know, a longer time. Uh, because um, I really want to let them get to know, you know, how, how it's being made and if the wood is locally sourced. Um, so after you get it, you talk about designs first, right? Mm, if design they want. first. And then, and then we build. And the building process, start with finding the wood. Finding the wood, yes. Um, in Singapore, we have some suppliers. Uh, um, but a lot of the wood in Singapore is imported there are some that are locally sourced la. but we don't have much variety la. I mean we are a city state yeah. so and then after we get the material we process the material here in the shop and then we start building la. so along the way maybe if um, I feel like the design is not working you know contact the client and we'll talk again Pretty much, the client usually trusts me a lot uh, to make changes or to consult on materials. And then we deliver. Customer. 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 And do they have the choice now that, you know, to do a, a wood joint or a... Yeah. Wood joint more expensive? No. Cause of course, uh, it will take more work. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's all... If, if I feel like you know, it, it would really help the piece in aesthetic or just structural. I would recommend it. No problem. And how much is like... That's the beauty of custom. Yeah, yeah. You get everything that you want. So if someone would want a, a custom table, how much should they come to you first before... Uh, I mean, should prepare uh, to have... Oh, prepare. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a regular dining table, maybe about 
um, upwards of three lah, three thousand. Three thousand uh, Singapore dollars. Okay, this is a table of six, right? Yeah. Okay. Not cheap, but that's the reason why it's not cheap too. I mean, that's that's actually why I want to emphasize on because I think a lot of people just see it as like, hey, just you know, a table I can get from Scantic or whatever, and you know why why it's just much more expensive, and well, like why don't you try to do? It? <laughs> <laughs> it's not really that also lah. I mean part part of it is that you're correct. Yeah. But um I think more clients are drawn to the fact that the table or their furniture has a story. Like not many people can say that hey, you know, my, my furniture was um locally made by a local craftsmen. And if 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 the wood is sourced locally even you know I think it's a bit of um An appreciation. Uh. Mm. Yeah. Like sure. in this world we we are so obsessed with materialism. But you know, um if you appreciate uh like let's say a dining table, right? It can be used for a lot of things. Eh? You know, people come together and eat. We share stories. Yeah. Icebreaker. Right. Yeah, no, I mean also when you spend more on a on a certain product, you actually think through whether this is something where, whereby you need, right? Versus when you can go to Ikea and buy something and the next thing you know, like a month later, you, oh, this doesn't suit my, uh, yeah, and you, you throw it out. No, I'm, I'm well aware, uh, like my, my, my prices are a bit above budget uh, for, for a, 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 a lot of people. Uh. But I guess a... It really depends on what you want. But you also talk about coming out with your own line of product. How is that coming along? Or is that idea being stashed or KIV? Um, right now, we are really busy with custom work. And it's just that the, the circumstances not mm. very, are not very conducive for producing a line. Yeah. We don't, I mean... No, I don't understand what you're talking about. Because um, the space a lot is of, limited. Yeah, a lot to consider lah. Maybe when the business is a bit more mature, um, a bit with a bit more um, like people have a bit more Trust. confidence in the brand, yeah. then you know it'll be better to timing and uh, timing. Correct, correct. Timing is important. <laughs> Agree. And you know, you always joke that if you could go back, uh, well, firstly, is that do you know that you're going to be a woodworker when you are studying in Melbourne? No. <laughs> <laughs> not, because not, you always joke that not for a second oh, no, if I were to go back again I would probably learn furniture uh, design or something along that yeah, line yeah. and in that in, in, in that on that note where would you go I mean if you can do it all over again yeah and or would you actually just choose to work under someone uh, a craftsman I would if I had the choice um, I probably wouldn't go to uni because it was an en- enriching experience uh, experience, but What's not necessary, la. Yeah. But I, 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 I enjoyed it, la. I mean, I got to know people that, that I know now that have shaped my my life in a good way, in a very good way. Learn a lot of things. But if if you ask me, I would I would go to um, a woodworking school in 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 Japan, because I, I I really like Japan and. I like that culture, but I'm still Singaporean. Don't worry. Oh yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, but is that a reason why Japan over like Sweden or you America? Japanese people are uh, they're very. If you look at their furniture, they their quality is insane. You know? <laughs> it's just insane. The level of quality, uh, they because like you know Japan's uh, Japanese people are known for their steel, for, among many other things, uh, like their samurai sword, you know. Yes, it's it can get really sharp, but that's the quality of steel, and so the raw material first is a lot better in Japan. Mm, not really, lah. Oh, not really. Uh, it's the process. Um, as they have a lot of manual processes, um, which is quite ironic, right? Because you know Japan is known for automation and Machineries. machinery. But in the craft scene, right, they, they, they have managed to preserve a lot of um, manual processes. Mm. So you have like old masters um, that still teach 
you know, how to sharpen a knife. And that, that was one of the reasons why I went to Japan for a while. Like, to study, to learn how to sharpen steel. Because it's actually very important uh, in the shop. If you want to attain a certain level of quality in your pieces, uh, mm. you need to learn how to work and sharpen knives, uh, planing knives, blades. So Would I that did be that also where you want to go if you can have a time off to... Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, it's still, it's still an option. Uh. Oh, yeah. But you know, I, st I don't have time. <laughs> I really don't have the time. Maybe I'll close for a while. Uh. Would, would, you, would you do that? <laughs> no, la, I don't think it's good for... Not right now. Uh. I don't think it's good to, to just, you know, up and go for a while. A while, what do you, how do you mean by a while? Because the time of a while was like two weeks. Well, two weeks, yeah. so depend, right? I think one year. Uh. One year would be good. Uh. One year would be good, right? It'll be nice. I'm going to Japan next week. But I have to find somebody else like me <laughs> to run this place. Isn't that the hardest part? Yeah, it's the hardest part, <laughs> man. <laughs> hey, so I remember at one time of time in the new studio, you have quite an open policy for um, people to come in to work on their own project. Ah, uh, yeah. Because, but you know, like how tools are very dangerous and versus now, you don't have the time. So... <laughs> At that time, um, I was more still exploring like where plane and bevel could poise itself, position itself. Mm. So I was thinking maybe if um, I get more people in to experience the craft, it would be a good thing. La. And it was. La. I mean, it, it brought a lot of different people to the shop. But then as time went by, um, my our project started to you know it started to get more serious and we just didn't have the time to organize you know people to come over and it's always been just me and recently jonathan so we we are we are thinking of doing workshops huh? i mean people have been really asking um whether we want to teach uh to do simple projects huh? But that one also, you need to allocate time. Uh, and it's resources also. Uh, yeah. Maybe on the weekends. I don't know. I'll see how it goes. Uh, yeah. Really. And say, for example, if there's a young, you know, young Rafi, uh, who is a wood enthusiast or want a maker, what do you think, like, what would, what would be your, your advice to them for, like, a three years or five years plan? Go to Japan. <laughs> No lah. I mean, knowledge ah. You need to start learning. But where can they learn? Here? Oh, you can learn. You know, I thought everything almost myself. You know. I probably know. It's like uh, YouTube, Google. But it wouldn't have the tools, right? Books. Um, if you look at the studio, there's a lot of books um, on uh, woodworking. And it's a lot of trial and error. Okay, so let's say right now. You, 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 they are just in a, any old regular, maybe they, they want to go to uni, mm. um, they want to learn, they have videos, but then I feel that the challenge might be where can they do it or what would be the most... Singapore has a number of um, maker spaces right? mm. uh, that, that recently, over the last few years... Anyone to recommend? Um, there's one at the... National Design Center. One maker group. Yeah, one maker group. I think they have a quite a uh, uh, well equipped workshop, uh, and they, there's a lot of um, instructors there that can assist. But you know, the, and the bottom line is they have to be like a sponge, you know, and just absorb knowledge and then implement it trial, trial and error because. This this line of work is really, it's you you do your stuff and then you get a physical product, so you have to trial and error like you have to do it physically, and you know, keep uh, and if it's and if it's um you know not to your expectation, do it again, scrap it, do it again, you know I spent so much time scrapping um final products, you know, just breaking it apart and then doing it again, it's a pain in the ass uh, but you know. It depends on what you want to achieve. Uh. And how about, you know, like the money style things? 
the like, mining side of things. To, I mean, because you know, you still need to feed yourself, right? Mm. In between the process, like how do you think? Like, do you think it's possible in three to five years' time with the amount of knowledge to to you know start having their own brand? Or maybe in between, they should really start like when. Like you, because you, your journey was that you started on Instagram mm. and people just find you. The money side of things, uh, at the start, it was very sketchy. Uh, like, because of rent in Singapore and the tools. You know, over the, the past, uh, the time plane and Bravo has been up. Almost everything is reinvested. Anything that I make is... Um, to rent food and tools. Tools are very important to me. I mean, the amount of tools in here could probably be, you know, uh, more than like 50,000. Easily. You know, it's, and it, maybe it's a small amount for, for a fabrication shop um, by like international standards. Uh, but, you know, it's... it's it's, it's, for me, it was very important that um, I get the right tools. Because with the right tools, right, you can uh, achieve that level of quality. Mm. But um, with less effort, more brain. Oh, yeah, the air yeah. compressor gun, for yeah. example. Yeah. You know? So, the nail gun. It's, it's like, um, you have to know uh, what, what tools to get. And to know, you need to learn. Uh, learn from other people. What's your favorite tools? My favorite tool? Uh? Yeah. If you, if you can choose, okay, maybe three. Uh. One would be two, two little. Machinery uh. or hand tool? Oh, man. Of course, there's a difference. You know? Okay. Well, uh, machinery, three machinery and three hand tools. Three machinery. So six, uh, six in total. You can choose six things. Um, table saw. Uh. That's the powerhouse yeah. of the shop and then you have is the, that the, the first table saw that we have back to then to no, now no the, the first one is there yeah, okay okay yeah I remember that this one is like primary school oh, okay and then this one is like upgrade to uni oh professional it's straight to uni okay okay <laughs> it's just the power la. it's right, more, right. more power and then uh, maybe the second one would be the jointer which is that that one yeah the jointer is uh, it's a flattening machine it makes wood flat Oh, that's so Which important. is very important in like um, casework when you make cabinets. So everything has to be flat and straight. It's it's actually woodworking uh, is very complicated. Well, well, it really is. Hey, you, you know what? <laughs> but a lot of people think a lot of people think like, yeah, why like, wood is not straight, right? I was yeah. like, well, it is not. <laughs> people have to really like spend whole day at the workshop. Uh, to see how, you know, things get done. And then the last uh, machinery? Mm, the bandsaw, uh, that one. Because that one, you can cut shapes. Oh, yeah. Not oh, even the sander, you, you saw your, your wood game with super raw. Huh? The sand, sanding machine. Sanding machine? I don't really like the sanding machine. Okay. <laughs> I like it, the sanding machine. Dust everywhere. <laughs> and hand tools? Hand tools. Uh. Hand tools has to be the kana. The kana. Kana is a, a Japanese hand plane. Oh yeah, that, that's the one you got It's from basically me. a block of wood. Yep. With a, with a blade yep. stuck in at an angle. And it's very traditional. To make it, to make it straight, right? Mm. That one takes a lot of work. Uh. <laughs> mm. That's why I got that one. Yeah. <laughs> and to, the last two? Or enough uh, la kana? Very good. Um, hand tool la. Your saw la. Drill la? Saw and drill, yeah. Okay la. <laughs> um, what sort of like mindsets or attitudes should like differentiate a hobbyist and a serious woodworker? Um, because we do know that there are some people who are just a hobbyist turn mm. a room, a HGB room yeah, yeah. into a woodworking studio, right? I guess the the mindset that they would have to adapt is um, one of openness. You need an open mind uh, to run a business. Because if you close yourself off to opportunities, then yeah, you might as well be a hobbyist. Uh. <laughs> uh, that's true, I am. 
um, I think there's there's a lot of in, in woodworking there's there's a couple of schools of thought mm. there are ones that are purely hand tools like they, they don't use machinery at all and there are some that are very pro machinery and I like to think right that it's good to be in the middle because the the purists they teach you about um, tradition and perseverance. It really is uh, because with hand tools, right, you, you need a lot of muscle and just it's sweat. Uh. But it's it, it, it teaches you really a lot about um, perseverance because you know it takes a lot longer. Yeah. And there's a lot more um it's just elbow grease. Uh. But machinery um, machinery, it, it helps with the efficiency of things, productivity. But in, in the shop, we, we use machinery, but it's controlled by human beings. So there's still that human element. The machinery only helps us to do things faster. And sometimes it's not necessarily a bad thing, because that's what purists argue. Lah. Like, faster doesn't mean better, you know, that kind of thing. But I guess as long as you know what you're doing and why you're doing it, you're trying to achieve a goal, that means like do a certain number of things in a certain period of time. I think all is okay. Right? All is I, think good, right? I think it's actually almost close to impossible to be a purist and to be a serious woodworking business. Yeah. <laughs> it's, you can't. You can't. Cause it's, it's more of like being an artist, though, you know, because well, imagine, okay, imagine right now you're a purist, right, and you just only use hand to how much will you need to charge for your table? Yeah, amazing, uh, amazing amounts. <laughs> but you know, the, if, if let's say you do it out of your flat, you don't pay rent, you know, you don't pay rent for that section. Of, um, I like what I like about what my position now is that I get to enjoy the wonders of technology. And appreciate, you know, the the beauty of working with hand tools. It it really is beautiful. Like it, it really is um very satisfying. Uh. So I get to straddle both schools of thoughts, and I love it. Uh. And that's partly why I have it as a business. You know, to sustain a hobby. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I think me too. No, because back then, back in the days, you remember? You, I think I wouldn't say you're only a woodworker because. You remember you started out playing with 3D design, you know, printing, 3D printing, and then you, you and then you're free to do wood. Then you went to Japan to try the, the hand tool stuff, and now you're bringing metal welding into the picture. Like, is there an underlying element that like tie all these things together? What do you enjoy out of like you know? It's creating. Uh, it, the 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 underlying um, principle is creating. I've always liked to create. Like even when I was younger, I told my mom I wanted to be a chef. Because I like cooking at that point of time. I mean, I still do. It's just that I don't cook as much as I, I, as I w w want to. Um, you know, I think if you think about like how I dabbled with 3D printing and now metalworking, you can, you can I, I saw it as, I just like to make. And 3D printing, metalworking, woodworking, it was all just mediums. For me to um, explore uh, my so-called making tendencies, yeah. you know, it was just different something, expression or creation. Yeah, something to to materialize what I wanted to do. It so I wouldn't call myself a woodworker really, um, because I well I I do um, design, I I work with wood. You know, it really is all these are just my medium. You know, like how an artist, for an artist, their medium is the canvas. You know, they paint. So, I guess this is how I see what I do. And also, I feel that in retrospect, if you're not doing woodworking, you're probably creating something. You, yeah. I would probably would. It's, it, I would gravitate to something that is like a, a maker, a making... Um, Something that has to do with the making process. Yeah. 
I mean, it's all a try and error, right? We, I mean, mm. we, we don't know what we'd like to mix with that. Let's just try 3D printing one day and then mm, not my thing and, you know, wood and well, I still metal. use it, actually. I you still, still like use it? 3D printing. Yeah. Oh, okay, what do, you, what, what do you last use? I use it for um, scale models. Oh. So, like, I'll print out scale models of the furniture yeah. for the client to see and appreciate proportion. And then they will say, like, Oh, you know, it, it's it's nice. And then I'll do it. I'll make it the actual size. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, Because cool. a lot of people don't really have the ability to see in proportion. And it's, 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 it's nothing wrong. Some people are just more attuned to seeing in proportion. And could I just add on to what you said is that everything that is here and that Rafi is doing right now is learned from YouTube. <laughs> 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 Even using the design uh, yeah, yeah. app, right? Yeah, software. <laughs> YouTube and a lot of common sense. Boy, I'll try now. You gotta put that in. Hey, let's move on to traveling, um, actually, because um, you've been to a few countries and met some woodworkers there. Mm. Um, I think both new school and old school, right? So mm. Indonesia, Thailand, Japan. Is there anything I, I missed out? Um, no, yeah, yeah. I think that's, that's about it, right? What do you think is like the main differences between like woodworkers over there and woodworkers here? The culture and also the culture of woodworking. Culture. Singapore has no culture of woodworking. <laughs> okay. They really don't. Yeah, yeah. Woodworking Why is... do you think why do you th I mean, let me, sorry to interrupt, but No no. What were you saying? Why do you think we don't? Because carpentry is an industry in Singapore. It's not a craft. There, there is no... Um, it didn't survive. La. Like, um, back in the olden days, like my grandfather, he was a boat maker. You know, they, you know those boats the, the, from China or the big fan and everything? Yeah, he used to make those boats, you know. And that's how my, my father used to help him. But it didn't survive. La. No one made it relevant. You know, no one, no one kind of like... Because in, in the whole um, rush of like nation building, I think that Singapore experienced in the 19... What, like after... A few centuries after independence, everything, priorities was all on like building an economy that was... Um, that they knew how to build in, in Singapore, you know, like... Uh, making Singapore a global, like a trading port or becoming a financial hub, you know, that was more attractive than, you know, um, yeah, like, you know, a administering programs to support craft, you know. We are still very young uh, our, as a country, even though it's only 50 years, it's only 50 years. Uh. Like, if you, look, if you look at countries like Japan, um, their, their history of craft goes back to the samurais, man. It's like very long knowledge and um, the government supports it. In Singapore, I, I would say the government does, but not in the right places. Lah. I mean, they, they see it as relevant. They see their money going into places like SFIC, Singapore Furniture Industry Council. But it's it's it it's really to support the industry la, of carpentry, cabinetry and all that. But much uh, very little for you know the stuff like what I'm doing, more creative form of furniture. I guess that's the big difference la, with like those countries that I've been to. And how's the woodworker over there? Any? Oh, they they're really cool la. <laughs> Even not, even not. From uh, if I, I was didn't, I didn't get to meet him. Oh, but yeah. I was I. I went to his shop, to his studio. Okay. Um, he was at his workshop, which was like a few which miles is now away. His, which is now his studio. I'm Another jealous, one container. Man, I honestly, I'm jealous. Like, uh, if I had that space. I think that's the challenge Singaporeans face. Yeah, that's one of the barriers to, you know, what we do. It's space, constraints. Um, it's more the price too. Price also, la. yeah. It's so, ex it's, rental is, is um, would be a killer la, for a startup. But if you really want to do it, then, you know, just do it. Lah. 
at most you fail, right? <laughs> so I, I think you have this mindset that a lot of people wouldn't have. And even, even comparing to me, like half the time I'm scared for you. You know, every time I come to you, it's like, hey, Rafi, you need help now, you know? Because you, like, an upgrade, this is an upgrade from your old place. Like, almost the rent double, right, coming to this place. And, and I'm, of course, I think there was one point you were like, okay, I'm sharing it with these other people uh, when you first came. Mm. And the other person just thought, like, oh, you know, I, will, uh, I need to go. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> couldn't make it. And couldn't make it. And, and I was like, well, okay, because well, then your rent doubled again. Um, yeah. And then the, another Japanese, the Japanese interior designer sort of came to share and then he left too. Hmm. So, now it's just plain and bare wall. <laughs> now it's just plain and bare wall. And I'm, it's something I'm really proud of. It's, for me, it's a milestone. Hmm. You know? it's, it's a lot. Yeah, like you said, mindset. You know, if your rent doubles, then it just means that you have to do double work. <laughs> <laughs> if you really want to do if you really want to do it uh. yeah yeah and and actually on, on a funny note I was searching your name on the internet and then I found your couch surfing profile oh really uh? yeah it's still there <laughs> it's still there <laughs> yeah it was from 2000 do you actually use is it I think I did uh, in Portugal um, when I was backpacking in Europe I think just one was that your first trip um, first trip where but like backpacking, like solo. It was oh, solo, no solo backpacking. No, I, I've I've been I've been solo backpacking since uni. Actually, yeah, that's something we knew of each other, but mm. I never really asked you on on that. Like, how did that happen? Like, how did that start uh, for you? Like solo backpacking because it's not a very normal thing that any old Singaporean would like. All right, let's just go on holiday. Um, just myself <laughs> and people like, like. Aren't you lonely? No la. But how, how did you... I mean, of course, now I know it's so beautiful to the serendipity of getting lost and, and learning and meeting new people. But how did you get started on that first trip and explore? Um, to, from Melbourne to Phuket. Oh. Yeah. Phuket. Alone? Solo? Alone, yeah, solo. Why do you choose Phuket? I like Thai food. Eh? <laughs> Bangkok lah. <laughs> no, but I like the beach also. Okay, okay. Because that one, we were coming right out of um, Melbourne in winter. So, a bit but of sun would be good. Yeah, you know? and then there's or either that or Bali, right? Yeah, but I don't really like... I mean, it's not that I don't like Bali. I prefer Phuket. Because of the food. And how did that lead up to Portugal and couch surfing? Oh, Portugal was part of a one-month trip around Europe. Oh. And just like, um, right into the north of Africa or so. No way. Morocco, Morocco. Oh, okay, okay, okay. It was really interesting. Uh. Very interesting. Was that your second trip out after? Or yeah. Like, uh, that was, uh, oh, that really? was after uni. Okay. That was after uni. So it was like a big gap. But like, it, during uni, I, I, I went to places, but in Australia, uh, like Sydney, by myself, you know. Um, then there were other trips also, but Europe was my, my the big one. Uh. And you tried couch surfing there? Yeah, yeah. But uh, very briefly, like, only one night. Then I went to a hostel. Oh, then like a... Uh, um, a bit weird. Uh, but, <laughs> but you know, I, not... I'm a big time couch surfer, right? Yeah, I know, I know. I know. <laughs> You're always bringing friends along with you. Then, yeah, yeah. Uh, couch surfing at your place. <laughs> it's quite cool. Uh. Yeah, no, because I, uh, when I did my trip to the US, I had no choice but the couch surf because my finances just is not enough to... Expensive. Uh. Well, like, hostels there are crazy. It's like Singapore price a bit for $30. Really? Uh, in the US? Uh? In here, in here in Singapore, twenty five to thirty dollars too. A night. Yeah, a night. Yeah, so I have no choice but to, uh, yeah, cou- use couch surfing, uh, to crash on people's couch. Uh. Yeah, but it's good lah because you are you're a really friendly guy. <laughs> you think it's so? It's appropriate. Are you not? I am la, but at times. Okay. <laughs> not all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Do you learn anything from traveling? Like like solo, like you know. <clears throat> is it, there's um there's a thousand and one ways to do one thing. So doesn't mean you know how to do something one way, it's the only way. La. What mean you I think that's like the guiding principle for how how I am in my relationships. Eh? You know, business relationship or personal relationship. Because um, 
if you if you if you look at I, I can't give you an example but at that time I was being exposed to like a lot of different cultures right? you know and some things are similar right, in cultures you know but you know they do it a different way but we do it a different way so and the end result is maybe the same or maybe slightly different but the important thing to note is you know you can do it a different way it's okay I think I know exactly what you're talking you about um, I take the analogy of how people live their life because I get to meet people you know firstly the couch surfing a uh, weird bunch of people to, mm. to be open their house <laughs> to, to to other people to come in uh, without knowing them um, and then most of the people there are like okay, so the story is my first trip Australia and then there's this actually there's Asian Asian Malaysian Chinese guy but is um it's Australian uh, in the in the in the forces and he got out already and the first day I went with him so I put my back and then we went to salsa dance there's a free lesson mm. and then we went to Chinatown drink some drinks and went back to his place he was he had this vest and he took out there was a huge knife like this this big behind him while well, he was salsa dancing with other people I was like oh my god that's crazy yeah correct so that's the question he actually was actually US and Australia are ally. So he was in every war after the Vietnam War. And, and the knife saved him a few times. And the explanation is that most people who have a gun don't want to shoot you. Because if they would want to, they have already shot you. And most people have never gotten hit by a gun. Versus everyone will get a paper cut. So they know how like, a knife will feel. And psychologically, that is also more scary in, oh. the, in that sense. So, but... Funnily enough, you know, like, I mean, we think if we haven't met that guy, we're like, no, I'm not going to be friends with a guy who brings a, a huge knife around on his back, right? But it turns out we became, like, really good friends. He came to Singapore, crashed on my couch. We went to do um, that. Um, but that, he didn't carry the knife around when he was in Singapore. Oh, well, he had a small knife. <laughs> <laughs> so he still had a knife. He still had a knife. Uh, and I actually, when I, when I go on my, my gap year, I call him, hey, you know, Rick, like, what, what knife should I buy? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And then he was telling me about oh, you need to have something here so that when you step, it doesn't, you know, you wouldn't hurt your hands. Oh, okay, well, that's good to know. <laughs> okay, let's do some really quick questions. Um, any books or documentary to recommend? Uh, books? Yeah. Um, when I was in uni, I think in my second year, I read this book by John... Uh, Crocker, um, it's Into the Wild. Oh, the one that was being made into a movie. Yeah, the one that has now been made into a movie. Lah. Um, I think that book really shaped my the way I think after uni. Why? It's a very interesting book. It's about, it's about the, the struggle of being, and it's a true story. It's about uh, a guy in the U.S. by the name of Christopher McCandles. He went to Alaska and then he eventually died. Lah, but it was um, a narration about his struggle to be himself <clears throat> while at the same time being accepted into society. So after he, after he finished, after he graduated, he burned all his possessions. And then he um, should we, should we he, stop there because okay. you know then we don't tell the whole story. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, people. So yeah, <laughs> that, that's the book. It, it's really, it's a really, it's a really good book. Uh, okay. Talk about about conviction. Advice. When, right now you are twenty eight. Eight. So advice for eighteen year old self then. Oh, and ten play, years ago. Uh. Please ask where you are at. What was I doing? Uh? Oh, I was I was serving tables. You were serving tables? Yeah, at uh, Tangling Club. 18? Aren't you in Australia? No, I already came back. Oh, okay. I, I came back. Bec I was waiting. I was waiting to be um, enlisted. Oh. So, uh, um, I thought, you know, why not just get a job? And I was serving tables at Tangling Club. To this, I was serving like martinis and um, cocktails to these Thai Thais, you know. You know Tangling Club is, right? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. In, in the middle of Orchard Road. It's crazy. Uh, Do you need to wear a suit? Like a bow tie? No, that time I was working at the, the pool restaurant. So I had this oh, flowery... 
you know this uh, beach shirt on. Okay, and then like shorts. Like. Yeah, so it's like every day was like at the beach. Uh, advice. Uh. Actually, I wouldn't change anything. Uh. Okay. You just... Um, Be yourself. Really, because who I am now is... It's a combination of all the decisions I've made. Either good or bad. You know, clever or stupid. You know, it's here I am now, and I kind of like where I am now. So you know, if you change something, who knows? For like the butterfly effect. Yeah, right? you might end up somewhere else. <laughs> uh, when you think of someone, the word successful, who came into your mind, and who would you define as success as successful? Oh. you know, I'm I'm prone to think of someone with a lot of money. But, you know, over time, I'm starting to think that, you know, success is not about that. I think if you find something you like, right, and you manage to do it, and you do it with passion, um, before you die, uh, you know? Yeah. Because then I, I guess that would be success uh, for me. Uh. Who do, do you have anyone in mind? Actually, I, I'm quite anti-Mac, you know, but I really admire Steve Jobs. It's like he gave the world something they didn't need. <laughs> and he grew it into such a huge company. I really admire him for that. Yeah. Morning routines or, or any routines or habits you find important? Coffee. Uh. I need coffee and I need about like Maybe half an hour of just not doing anything. Just maybe staring into space. It really is. It's just kind of like meditation. collecting my thoughts. Huh? And maybe it is meditation. But I do it with a cup of coffee. Lah. You know, I do it here in the office or just standing in the shop. It's really important for me to get my bearings. Huh? What are some of the most common misconceptions about you or your work? Oh. <laughs> You're like, oh, too much. So many, man. <laughs> people people um, think I'm a younger version of you know, those ape that do cabinet. Which is, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a fair... <laughs> because I am surrounded by them every day. I see them, I talk to them. Um... I think the most common misconception is that my work is easier. Because they don't, they don't necessarily say it, but they say it when you talk about price. So they'll be like, oh, so expensive. Huh? You know? <laughs> then, then after that? It's like, your table takes like two weeks to make, you know? You know, that kind of thing. And the amount of work involved, that maybe How that do you explain one. to them? Um, I get them to come to the shop, huh? Oh yeah, that's, that's why you get them to come yeah. to the shop, right? That, that's, how, that's how they see, oh, the wood's so big. Uh. You know, like... <laughs> how to carry, uh. <laughs> the table's so big. Uh. <laughs> Just let them have a feel of, you know, the hot and sweaty workshop. <laughs> then they'll understand. Okay, okay so um, what are some upcoming projects um, um, that people can look forward to? And where can people find you on the internet? Um... Plainandbravo.com. We have our website. Um, they can get us through there or just give me a call. Uh. The number is on the site as well. Um, what are some upcoming projects? Uh? Um, a lot more furniture. Uh, and we are also planning to, you know, start, slowly start a product line. Not say... Uh, a very consistent product line, but like pieces that we make and then we retail to whoever wants to buy it. Um, I think that's the one of the end game for Plain and Bevel to be positioned in the Singapore market as you know something uh, uh, a local furniture maker that retails also, uh, not just custom makes. Mm. Custom making will always be part of the 
uh, what we do lah. But um, I want to offer because with retail, we I can make whatever I want to make. You know, <laughs> and you know, you want to buy it, you buy it lah. If you don't, then someone yeah. else will buy it. <laughs> But custom is more like the, the client. You. You know, the client, the client wants to to make something in particular. Hmm. You know. All right. We're done. Okay. Then done. Finish. finish. Ah, apa tayar? Ah, I never talk so long. <laughs> hey, what's up, people? It is over. So all show notes, links, books can be found on our website, brianvictor.com, B-R-O-Y-A-N. And if you have any misfits that you'd like to hear from, feel free to comment in the blog post or drop me an email. So in the coming weeks, we have two very lovely ladies who at the age of 21 started a social cultural magazine while being full-time students, while living in different time zones. So their pilot issue explores the notion of arriving at an age or the awkwardness between childhood to adulthood. So stay tuned. Uh, you can also sign up for the mailing list on the website. If anything, I hope you guys have a great day ahead and I will see you guys soon. Music